So um, I have the privilege of uh, taking us through the profile bio today. My name is Winnie, Winnie Kivuva. Yes, I'm from Mombasa. It's uh, quite hot here today, uh, but we thank God for the weather. And so I'll take you through the bio. I also serve in the, in the marketplace ministry. Yes, uh, so I'll take you through the bio. I'm quite humbled to be able to take us through this bio because it's quite uh, an extensive profile. So the speaker for today is Dennis Tongoi. Dennis Tongoi is the root uh, to fruit master trainer. He holds a doctor in theology and missiology from the University of South Africa. He is the founding international director emeritus of CMS Africa. He coordinated Samaritan Strategy Africa, a movement of over 600 trainers on biblical worldview and holistic discipleship in more than 40 countries in Africa. Dennis has engaged with several community leadership initiatives, among them Board of Chair of Carlisle College, um, General Secretary of Christians for a Just Society, mobilized and facilitated Christian professionals in addressing issues of poor governance and corruption. Dennis was National Director for the Navigators Kenya from 1995 to 2000. He led a team of uh, that expanded the ministry in Kenya beyond Nairobi to Mombasa, Kisumu, Homa Bay, Eldoret, Machakos, Kitui, and Embu. He helped establish the Economic Project Trust Fund, EPTF, micro enterprise program for navigator lay leaders, consolidated the national leadership team, developed 10 year vision before successfully uh, transitioned leadership. Dennis served as the business leadership manager for an executive MBA program run by the Copenhagen Business School in collaboration with Mount Kenya. Over 110 CEOs, by the, by over 110 CEOs of Kenyan companies have been mentored through his program. Dennis is a director at Hubble Garden Limited, an agribusiness SME established in 2007, and Bezalel Investments Limited, engaging in funding real estate development established in 1991. Dennis also has a number of publications on business, missions, economic issues, etc. Uh, Dennis has done quite a number of publications. We have Mixing God with Money, Strategies for Living in an Uncertain Economy, Nairobi, uh, that is Bezalel Investments Limited, uh, 2001 to 2016. Uh, Business as Mission and Mission as Business, Case Studies of Financially Sustainable Christian Mission Ventures with a focus on Agri Anglican Diocese in East Africa, Doctoral Dissertation, University of South Africa 2016, Building a Prosperous Kenya, a Perspective of the Church, God's Primary Agency for Social Transformation, Nairobi CFJS Economic Task Force, Tongoi, B.O. and Karithi B.K. 2005. Study Guide Africa version, My Business, My Mission, Fighting Poverty Through Partnerships Granted Rapids, Partnerships Worldwide. Can the Righteous Reach Transform Africa? That is Mauritius, Academic 2017. Bridging the Divide, Mission and Social Innovation in East Africa. Bossi and uh, Smith C. Missional Conventions, a Dialogue Between Theology, Tongoi, 2015. And then we have Prayers in World Mission, SCM. Um, the publications are quite uh, extensive and the bio is quite also extensive. And so what I will do at this point is that I'll just pray for the session and then we can take it over to Dennis to take us through this. So let us kindly pray. Father Lord, we come before your presence this afternoon. We are grateful for your mercies. We are grateful, Jehovah, King of all creation, for the fact that you've brought us from all the way the entire week you have been with us. Um, we've had amazing sessions. And we do pray that today you will also be with the speaker, Dennis, even as he brings uh, what he's prepared, or rather what you have prepared for us through him. We pray that indeed our hearts will be prepared, we will be ministered to, and the word will definitely fall on fertile ground. And we do pray that indeed you will guide us through this entire session, and you will be with us every step of the way. May you guide Dennis, and may you give him wisdom in everything that he gives us. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ we do pray, trusting and believing. Amen. Over to Dennis and thanks everyone. Good afternoon. 
um, again, getting used to this um, Zoom uh, environment. Sometimes it's hard to be able to know who is on, who is not on. But today I'll be talking about um, dualism. But I thought I might just want to mention to you that today is almost um, exactly 20 years since I retired from the Navigators on the 28th of August, the year 2000. So it is one day uh, exactly to the, to, the, to, the, to the date. And since then, the Lord has really led me in the dimension in the direction of engaging in what is now called the marketplace. That word did not exist in our days. In fact, those of us who had that vision were seen as being worldly and being, having lost our vision for discipleship. So it is a great honor to be able to share this. And um, right now I'm engaged in developing materials uh, for marketplace uh, people who are dealing in a cross-cultural context, particularly engaging between the West and Africa to help them understand how the mind, African mindset operates when they're doing businesses in Africa. And this is under an initiative called Root to Fruit. Now, the question one asks of the Apostle Paul, was he a um, businessman or a missionary? But before, um, before we do that, let's just, um, I'd like to just keep, Continue to pray. I know we've prayed, but let me just continue to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts as we look at your word, that you'll open our minds to see the truth of scripture, and that you'll equip us and prepare us, Father, for the purposes for which you created us. We thank you for this medium, for engaging, and we thank you that your word continues to be real and live and does not return void. We bless you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. So the question one would ask, I think one of the most famous missionaries was Apostle Paul. Was he a businessman who did mission or is he a missionary who did business? And if you look at this um, verse in Acts chapter 20, it's very clear that he did not get money from somewhere to go and do his ministry. Is that he made money from somewhere and supported himself and his companions and went to do the work that he did. So in our day and age, we have separated the two and we've actually confused what it means to be the marketplace and what it means to be ministry. And we somehow assumed that those who are in what we have come to refer to as ministry are superior to what those who are in the marketplace are doing. But for the Apostle Paul, this is not the issue. He needed what he had to do to raise the resources he needed to do because God had given him a mission and a vision and a purpose. The Church Mission Society that I worked with for 20 years was involved in the anti-slavery movement. When slaves were, were emancipated as a result of 33 years of pressure or political pressure, they were forced to be involved in business. And as a result, some of the economies of some countries in Africa are actually as a direct result of mission work. The cocoa industry in Ghana, the cotton industry in Nigeria, textbook center here in Nairobi, which is very, very uh, famous, was actually a CMS project, Maridari Fabrics, and I could go on and on and give you examples of missions which have involved with business. A friend of mine who's a businessman, a major investor in the real estate sector, he came to Christ in the 1970s. And at that time, there was a revival going on in Venezuela. But he observed that the more the churches were filled, the poorer the economy became. And he came to the conclusion that you cannot make disciples in the church. In fact, I may be putting it emphatically, it is impossible to make discipleship in the church. And even let me add, add the, the, the caveat, or in the Bible study group, we have assumed that disciples are made in churches or in Bible study groups. Disciples are made in the marketplace and not in church buildings. We can teach about discipleship in the church. We can teach about discipleship in the Bible study group, but discipleship is lived out in the family sphere and in the marketplace. It is how you live out your faith in that sphere that demonstrates you're a disciple of Christ, not which church you attend 
or how many Bible study groups you go to. Those are important for teaching, but discipleship can only be lived out in the public sphere. We have limited discipleship or, or, or um, Christian mission to being born again in our hearts. And that is important and it's a beginning place. But we also re realize we need to be born again in our minds. Paul talks about that in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, about being renewed in your mind. But also let's realize that also Christ tells us that at the end of all things, there will be the renewal of all creation. So our discipleship needs to involve our hearts, our minds, and how we steward the creation that God gave us. A mandate given to us in Genesis chapter 1, which was ne no, has never been rescinded and will continue to eternity, will always be co-creators with God and engaging with this renewed creation when Christ returns. The new Jerusalem will not be in heaven, it will be coming down from heaven to earth. So the greatest challenge and threat to the church, said John Stott, was the dichotomy between the church, what the church is on Sunday, and what the church is on Monday. We have two ideas of church, or two dimensions of church, which is actually rooted in what is a dualistic worldview. Dualism is actually rooted in a Greek worldview or a Greek dichotomy. Because the Greeks perceived the world as divided into two. The spiritual, which was sacred, and the physical, which was secular. This Greek dichotomy has impacted Western civilization to such an extent that a lot of the gospel and Bible teachings we have from Western countries are, pre, are, pre, are based on a, on a dualistic, secular view of the world. Western secularism divides the world into the upper sacred and the lower secular. And the upper is, is supposed to be the place of grace and the lower the place of nature. And so our lives are divided to the place of grace or the place where values are, are, are discussed is seen as what you do with your faith, your theology, your ethics, your devotional life, and the gospel. But then the real world is seen as the world of reason, science, business, politics, etc., etc. This view of the world is not a biblical view of the world, it's actually a pagan view of the world. And it has resulted in the perception that Sunday is the most important day of the week, and weekdays are lower and less important. So the pastor sees themselves as doing the most important work of the week and the rest of us then go and do the lesser works. We have indeed reversed the role between business and mission, like I shared in Aaron about Paul. Now, I very much respect the work of pastors. I'm an ordained minister of the Anglican Church. But the role I help pastors realize is if you are the coach of a football team, when the team is playing in the field and continues to lose, they don't fire the goalkeeper, they fire the coach. Because the coach is the most important person who equips and trains the players to win or lose matches. But the game is not played in the, in the locker room the game is played on the field. So pastors play a very critical role. Bible studies and Bible study leaders play a very critical role, but that is not where the game is played. The game is played in the field. And the field is in the family sphere and in the marketplace. But I believe that it's very easy that the pulpit has hijacked the plot to where we assume that those who are in the pulpit ministry or to use a term that is familiar with the navigators, full-time ministry, advanced doing ministry, and the rest of us are supposed to support them. This is an unbiblical view of mission. In fact, one of the most effective missionary movements today in the world is the Redeemed Christian Church of God of Nigeria, which is in over 150 countries in the world now. And they send out professionals to go and plant churches. 
None of the churches are led by full-time ministers. They're all led by professionals. Teams of 10, some of them are doctors, teachers, but they go into a country, and even when the offering is given, it doesn't go to supporting the so-called full-time people. It goes to supporting the work of, the, of expanding the churches. When they hold an annual meeting, the leadership team meeting alone is about 3,000 people who come together because they have delinked their so-called paid professionals to do mission with people in the marketplace who receive their pay from the marketplace and extend the gospel. The marketplace is really the place of influence in the city, the place where cities are discipled, the place of education, commerce, justice, the domains of society, as someone has called it, eight mountains, places of health, etc. And God's intention was always that we do not just make disciples, but we make disciples of the nations, not in the nations. We're not called to have Bible study groups in the, in the marketplace. We're called to disciple the marketplace, to disciple the nations, not just be in, but make disciples of the nations. Martin Luther, the reformer, was very clear about this. He knew that the works of monks and priests, however holy and arduous they be, do not differ one whit in the sight of God from the works of the rustic laborer in the field or the woman doing her household tasks, but that all works are measured before, by, by God, before God by faith alone. Indeed, the menial housework of a man's servant or maid servant is often more acceptable to, acceptable to God than all the fastings and works of a monk or a priest because the monk or the priest lacks faith. What Martin Luther say, here is saying that it is faith that defines our work and you can be in the pulpit without faith or you can be in the kitchen living in faith, trusting God and seeking to glorify him. So not the sphere of our service, it is a state of our heart where as we work seeking to glorify God, every aspect of our life is lived for his glory. The challenge today is we have trainings on business or being in the marketplace that lacks a theological content. This was not always the case. The early church fathers, the people who put together the great universities like Oxford and Harvard, always began with theology as what they call the king of education. So that theology informed how all other disciplines were to be lived out. But today we have a dichotomy where we have business education without theology, and we also have theological education without business content. And this became very, very clear in 2008 during the global financial crisis, when people realized that the world as you know, financial world as you know it, lacked an ethical foundation because the theological uh, integration was absent. And for me, having been involved in ministry for over the last 40 years, the challenge has been this dualistic view of Bible study, but we do not engage with, 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 the, with the marketplace as it should be. Abraham Kuyper was the, one of the prime ministers of Holland, and he was an ordained church minister, a reverend like myself. And he went into politics because God called him to disciple the nation. And he said, no sphere of human life is conceivable in which religion does not maintain its demands that God shall be praised, that God's ordinances shall be observed, and that every laborer shall be permeated with, with his aura in fervent and ceaseless prayer. Whatever man may stand, whatever he may do, whatever he may apply his hand in agriculture, in commerce, and in industry, or his mind in the world of art and science, he is, in whatever it may be, constantly standing before the face of his God. He's employed in the service of his God and is strictly to obey his God. And above all, he has to aim to the glory of his God. This was the mindset that the reformers Martin Luther and Abraham Kuyper and others had when the, uh, um, the revival, the uh, global revival took place in the early, uh, late, late 19th century. There was no separation between worshiping God and doing our service because service to God was worship and worship was service to God in whatever 
space God called you to. Nils Hauge was a Christian who was involved in business in Norway. He founded 30 companies in his nation. But because he was not ordained to preach, he was arrested for preaching because he had no license. But the country had to call him back from prison when there was a major industry that was required to be revived, the making of salt to uh, prevent the roads from freezing. But here was the opposite. A businessman who preached without a license and was jailed for it. And today, research in his country, in Norway, and they, I've given you the, the uh, website there, shows that wherever Hauge's 30 companies were established in that country, that part, those parts of the country are thriving economically. Wherever Hauge did not go, those parts of the country are diminished in economic activity. So he used his Christian faith and Christian gifts to start businesses for the glory of God. Although, and he preached and he, he ministered as he went about it. Although secularism had already begun to impact the West at that time and the secular spiritual divide had become a reality. He was not allowed to preach because he was called a businessman. And we could tell more and more and more stories of business people who impacted their communities. We we'll talk about Arthur Guinness, who was so concerned about the, the uh, drunkenness in Ireland caused by cheap alcohol. He cried out to God, what can I do as a Christian? And God gave him a formula to make Guinness. And the, and the strap line for Guinness was, Guinness is good for you. And Guinness was made as a nutritional drink with very high B, B complex. And people who drank Guinness were built up instead of bringing, bringing their, 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 their cheap alcohol which destroyed them. And after Guinness, through the investments that, that, that um, the, the beer brought about, was able to sponsor the China Inland Mission. And uh, Hudson Taylor the China was, uh, was able to go and proclaim the gospel in China. So business and mission have always been working in tandem. Jesus' strategy was as a marketplace minister. Like I say, the God's agenda has been hijacked by what I call pulpit ministers to make it as if the pulpit ministry is the only ministry. The pulpit ministry is a significant ministry, but it is not the ministry, but it is, it is part of God's uh, agenda, but not the only agenda. 50% of Jesus' adult life, he was a carpenter. And he made good furniture because if he did not, he would have found it very difficult to preach a sermon and say, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If he did not, he would have found it very, very difficult to have people follow him if he was a lousy or bad, poor businessman. Of Jesus' 132 public appearances, 122 were in the marketplace. So only 10 were in the temple. Of the 52 parables, 45 were marketplace. Uh, in, the, in the context of the marketplace. Jesus talks about construction, winemaking, farming, ranching, management, labor crop, crop yield, misuse of money, venture capital, in high-risk institutions, family-owned businesses, hostile takeovers, etc., etc., etc. Talk about bankruptcy, and Jesus was very much a marketplace minister. Jesus' disciples were marketplace people. Peter, Andrew, James, John, fishermen, Nathaniel, probably a farmer, Matthew, a tax collector. None of the 12 were leaders in the temple or synagogue, or to use our, our navigator language, none of them were full-time. These are people in the marketplace, living and making a contribution through their professions. And of 40 divine interventions recorded in the book of Acts, 39 were in the marketplace. Only one was in the temple. So you begin to realize that Jesus' strategy was actually countercultural because the religious sector had taken over and dominated what would have been God's agenda. And in fact, you're aware it is the religious class that put Jesus to the cross, the Sanhedrin and the religious people with their long robes and, uh, and uh, religious, religious piety. 
And Jesus then leaves the writing of the Gospels to marketplace people. Dr. Uh, Dr. Luke, Matthew, uh, Matthew the tax collector, John the fisherman, Mark probably part of a wealthy family. So as you look at Jesus, you begin to ask yourself, what happened? Where did we begin having this perception that there is ministry, which is in the, the people in the marketplace are not part of the, uh, the center of God's agenda. Part of this is a misunderstanding of the cross and the death of Jesus Christ. In Colossians 1, verse 15 to 20, the Bible clearly says there that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, invisible and invisible, with the thrones of powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, in him all things hold together, and is the head of the body, the firstborn from among the dead, and in everything he might that in everything he might have his supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, making things on earth or things in, uh, in, in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, I failed to understand what the cross meant, or a limitation to thinking that the cross was only there to save our souls, or the blood of Jesus was only meant to help us be born again in our hearts, is what is part of the dualistic view that limits our discipleship. We must have born again hearts, but so must we have born again minds, or we must go back to our original mandate to take care of God's creation, because the earth too is going to be renewed. The Bible talks about Romans 8, creation groans as it awaits to see the revelation of the sons of God. So the challenge is we're told to not love the world, and the word world is the world's cosmos or the world's systems. Unfortunately, most of us, we live our discipleship with a dualistic mindset, where we see the upper room I shared earlier on, or the upper level, as faith, Bible study, devotions, and the lower level as science, work, employment. And so we go into the world and operate in the world using the world system, and no wonder we find our witness ineffective, and no wonder we find ourselves um, um, disarmed by the world. The Bible is very clear. There are two systems, two kingdoms. The kingdom of light or darkness and the kingdom of this, uh, or the, uh, the kingdom of this, this world. So the kingdom of light or the kingdom of this world. It's either darkness or we're part of God's restorative agenda. The passage we read in Colossians 1 verse 15 to 20 tells us that Jesus died to reconcile all things to God. And when we're in the marketplace, we are, we are actually enforcing God's kingdom. And that is why we're told not to love the world because the world is driven by a different set of values. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But we are warned not to conform to this age not to copy the behavior of the world, but be renewed in our thinking. So if we are to think about marketplace ministry, people in the marketplace need to engage, not just because they are born again, and not just because they have renewed mindsets, but also they have a, a renewed understanding of God's agenda. God's agenda or his, his promise to Abraham to bless the nations, and his promise, or his, 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 um, the message that Jesus proclaimed to preach the kingdom. So we're to use our worldly wealth. We're to use our gifts to advance his kingdom so that when we are done, we'll be welcomed into the eternal kingdom. 
So how do we do this? Can you imagine a story of Noah without the ark? Noah's ark was part of God's purpose for him. The ark was God's means of redemption when he was going to judge the world because of his judgment on the world. It took 120 years to build. It was used for just over six months and it will not go to heaven. So when people ask me, Dennis, why do you spend so much time building your business or in your business? I tell them because the vision for my business is to be a redemptive agent in, in today's society. The businesses that I'm involved in, I'll give you uh, two examples. One is I'm involved with the aloe vera value chain. And part of this is because I believe that people's health is important. If one's health is not, if, uh, is not um, uh, uh, up to par, it doesn't matter how much Bible study you do, you must have a healthy body in order to serve God and a healthy mind as well. So I'm committed to my business because it uh, adds value and redeems fallen, the people's uh, uh, fallen creation. I've been involved in the marketplace ministry seeking to bring about redemption, particularly in the retail value chain. You see the collapses of Nakumat, you see the collapses of Tuskies and others for different reasons. But a few of us have asked ourselves, how do we as Christians help redeem that marketplace so that all Kenyans thrive? So your business, God has placed you there so that that business itself is not just the place where you make money and go and do ministry. The business itself is a ministry and God wants to use that business or that vocation, whether you're a doctor, or you're a teacher, or a civil servant, he wants to use that vocation itself as a means of his redemption. He wants you to be a redemptive agent where he has placed you. Jesus preached the kingdom. He did not preach the church. The word kingdom appears 90 times in the four gospels. His kingdom is where Christ is king. His main message was a good news of the kingdom. And he sent his disciples to go and preach the kingdom. And like I said earlier on, you cannot preach the kingdom in a church building, in a Bible study group. You can encourage each other, you can strengthen each other in a Bible study group or in the church building or in a Zoom conference, but you cannot make disciples or proclaim his kingdom until you get out there. And so when Jesus asked the disciples um, to pray, Jesus, first of all, um, his main message was to preach the kingdom. And just in case you want to know his mission statement, Luke 4 verse 33 says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God, and that is why I was sent. So somebody once said that God has his people where he wants them to be, but are they God's people where they are? The church is gathered on Sunday, or used to be gathered on Sunday, to worship and be equipped. But God has scattered and placed the church on Monday in the marketplace so that his kingdom can be proclaimed. And the most important people but the most significant people in advancing his kingdom are what I call the frontline foot soldiers. They are in the marketplace on Monday, equipped by a gifted teacher on Sunday, but living out their faith and proclaiming and living out kingdom values on Monday. And so when we go to work on Monday, what should our prayer be? First of all, we recognize that the kingdom of God is everywhere where his rule has been established. His kingdom rules over all. We don't go to a place to establish God's kingdom. His kingdom already rules in every place. We go to reclaim it for God. Christ rules over every sphere. We're not going to try and make him rule or make him king. We're there to acknowledge him as king in every sphere of our lives. And the nature of God's kingdom system, as opposed to the world's kingdom system, 
is righteousness and justice. So when you go out into the marketplace, what are you going to do? You're going out to promote righteousness and justice. What does righteousness mean? Righteousness means right relationships. And justice means equitable relationships. So if you are, like my brother said, you're in, uh, you're in the Ministry of Health, why, why has God put you up there? So that you can be salt and light, preventing injustice, promoting right relationships. God has not placed you there by accident. He's placed you there as salt to preserve that particular ministry. What I find Christians is we often assume that God has placed us in a particular role to take over the entire institution. That was never God's agenda. God's agenda is for you to be salt and light, to be present in every institution so that your presence promotes righteousness and justice. The wicked will fear to do wickedness when they know a righteous person is around. We're not called to take over. We're not being told to make Christian uh, political bank, political uh, parties, or even start Christian banks, or start Christian hospitals. Although those are good, it is a Christian witness presence that allows us to be, to be uh, effective in advancing God's kingdom. And so wherever God has placed you, there's one prayer he asks you to pray on a daily basis. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Whether you are selling me tumba clothes or you're a teacher, you have one agenda, to proclaim the kingdom of God and to see his will being done in that context. So whenever you see God's will not being done because of injustice, injustice or unrighteousness, I believe you begin to see why God has placed you there. You may not be able to bring a solution in one day or one week or even one year. For William Wilberforce, it was 33 years before he saw the abolition of the slave trade. One of the books you saw that I co-wrote with um, Kibuka Karidi was Building a Prosperous Kenya. And this was under Christians for a Just Society which is a movement of some of us who believed in the kingdom of God, who said, how can we change Kenya and see justice and righteousness? And one of the outcomes of that was the law that was put into place to have votes counted where they are cast during an election. Now we're involved in a lot of other activities I cannot go into in, in, in this seminar, but we're saying where injustice and unrighteousness take place, God wants me to do something to proclaim his kingdom. You ask me to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But dualistic Christians leave their faith in church or in the Bible study group and go into the world. We are called to represent the king in this world as his ambassadors. And the two world systems, the world system is built on lies, John 8 talks about Jesus, uh, Satan being the liar and the father of lies. The God's kingdom system is built on truth. We shall not steal, lie, or deceive one another. So in what ways are the lies of Satan embracing or undermining God's kingdom where it's placed you? And how can you bring about God's truth? The world has an exploitative system. The kingdom has an empowering system. The world has a destructive system and the kingdom has a development system. So when you see yourself as an ambassador, you then see yourself having the opportunity for God to work through you to advance his kingdom. Somebody once said that we do not building the kingdom, but building for the kingdom. So we are ambassadors of God's kingdom in the marketplace. We not live in two worlds, the upper world, which is spiritual, and the lower world, which is, which, is, which is secular. We live in one world, ruled by our king, Jesus, who is Lord over everything. We don't make him king, he was born king. We don't try and, and advance his kingdom, his kingdom rules over all. We are reclaiming his kingdom where Satan has stolen it away. So we need to have a long-term perseverance in the marketplace. I wish I had more time to give you testimonies of some of the initiatives 
that have been involved in, that have taken 10 years without seeing fruits, just like the club from Sector 33 years, but we persevere because we still see injustice. We need to seek systemic change, identify and address belief systems, the laws, the marching orders that impact on the nations experiencing injustice. For example, if you were to look at how people drive today, and most of you look a uh, uh, younger generation, the philosophy of driving today is me fast or make way for me. You'll find a church service being finished and it's the people who are attending the church service cannot graciously go out of the compound without making each other angry or fighting because it's me fast and make way. What did we go and say, give way? What should happen in Nairobi if all of us, or Mombasa, or Eldoret, wherever it is you are, if you became the kind of driver who gives way to others? Our traffic would flow. So it's a paradigm shift we're looking at. Most businesses, most people in the marketplace are looking for how do I meet my need today, or what quick wins can I have for myself? What is the need for me? Versus how can I make a difference? So we need to redefine our place in the market, in, in our place in the marketplace, not as a destination, but as a journey. We need to build trust groups within our spheres of influence and ask ourselves, how do we support one another to live righteously and justly in this context? Unfortunately for most of us, because our only identity is with our church groups or Bible study groups, when we go to the marketplace, we find ourselves standing alone, what I call the Elijah syndrome. We think we're the only ones who have not bowed our knee to Baal. You may be a farmer, but because navigators never discuss farming or ask you how your farming is doing, you assume that you're, you're called to just go and do farming and then give tithes to a navigator full-time person to teach you Bible study. That is not ministry. The ministry is the farming itself, producing goods that are healthy for people, and as you do so, demonstrating love and concern for your workers and demonstrating the kingdom of God to your community and are giving people the reason to ask you, why do you have this hope in you? And you tell them it's because of Jesus. God has placed you where he wants you to be. Are you doing God's work where you are? This is in no way to discount um, um, ordained ministers or full-time ministers, but recognize that they are not the frontline ministers. Marketplace ministers are. Jesus placed us in the world. He says, I've told them many things, what was with them in this world, that they may be filled with joy. He gave us his word, and the world hates us because we do not belong to this world. But he did not want to take us out of the world. He says, I'm asking you not to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. It's very unfortunate when most people feel that, that for them to become closer to God, they need to leave the world and leave the marketplace to go into full-time ministry. Now, God has called some to full-time ministry, like he did myself and many others. But that's not God's intention for everybody. His primary intention is the majority of us are going to be in the world but not of the world. And what we need, we need to pray is to be kept safe from the evil one. We do not belong to the world, but we're not of the world. So Jesus prays. He prays not for the world, but he prays for those who belong to him in the world so that they may bring him glory. He said he's departing from the world, but they are staying in this world. And he prays they may be united will be united in the world, just as he and the Father are. So one question I'd ask for us, as I conclude, is how do we survive as Christians in the marketplace? We need to create systems and structures that allow us to be able to be effective in our witness and support one another in the sphere of influence that God has called you to. Are you in business? Which business sector has God placed you in? Are you in the health sector? Are you in the music and art sector? And I'm so glad to still have heard that song sung today. We need to, people in the art sector, in the music sector, 
who are going to bring about God's kingdom through the giftedness in music and art. We need people in the political sector who are going to be in present, not Christian political parties, but Christians in political parties who will stand up and say no when things are going a different way. This is the example we have of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich person, the Bible describes him as wealthy. And when the Sanhedrin was voting to crucify Jesus, he did not cast his vote. He abstained. But when Jesus was crucified, he took Jesus' body and put him in his own tomb. People in the marketplace, Obadiah, Obadiah the prophet, was actually in um, King Ahab's palace. Ahab was one of the most wicked kings, but God raised up Obadiah in a wicked system. Somebody may tell, may tell you, why are you a Christian in that particular political party? Look how wicked it is. But you may be the Obadiah in the Ahab's palace. So that when God wants his people saved, you can hide the people, uh, God's people, because God has placed you there for a purpose. So my, my um, uh, concluding remarks are that it's my prayer and desire that each of us who are in the marketplace will redefine afresh, recognize afresh God's call for us and avoid the Western secular dualistic mindset, which divides the world into two, secular and spiritual, upper house and lower house, because Jesus is king. He is Lord over everything. His kingdom rules over everything. And it's, there's, no, there's no other kingdom. And we go to enforce his kingdom. The God of this world has a counterfeit kingdom, usurping the rule of, of Christ in every sphere. But we who know and follow Christ, because all authority in heaven and on earth was given to Christ, we can go and make disciples of the nations. We can go and see our spheres of influence beginning to, to reflect God's righteousness and God's justice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dennis. That was um, a very interesting uh, perspective on um, this uh, dualism. Um, it's uh, the question and answer time, and uh, I think I can see people have posted a few questions on the chat section. I think I would encourage uh, the others who have questions to continue posting them there. How do you reconcile uh, the account Acts 6 verse 1 to 4, where they set aside some? I'm assuming that's the issue of the deacons. Mm. Um, now. That's a very, very interesting thing because that actually is a very good illustration of a dualistic mindset. Uh, let me just go through that. Because deacons in the Old Testament were not spiritual, spiritual work. It was actually people who did met material needs. And in those days, there were no supermarkets. So deacons were those people who were set aside to go to the supermarket to bring food and give to the poor. There were those who were help, to help the poor create wealth. And so the people in that list in Acts chapter 6 were all actually marketplace people. It is just that their role was defined differently. Now, for you and me, who is a non-Jew and highly influenced by Western secular um, uh, dualistic mindset, we cannot help but see ourselves always in two different roles. For the Jew, there was not ever two roles. You always were involved in a trade somewhere. Jesus was a carpenter. Paul was a tent maker. And part of it, if you, if you need, to, need to understand this, is that when you live in a very good climate like Kenya, you can do your work, whatever it is, throughout the year. But when you live in a, in a place where there's winter and summers, during the winter period, Paul could not travel. And if you look at the book of Acts, there are times when you're shipwrecked because they had winter somewhere. So what did he do during the winter? He built tents. He put together tents, which is then sold, and at the end of the book of Acts, we see him living in his own house, paying for by his own money. And there's no conflict between making money as a tent maker and no money uh, uh, between uh, uh, so-called ministering to people. Now, the thing which is, clear, which is clear in Acts chapter 6 was not so much the six who are set aside, but the fact that the 12 wanted to focus on preaching and teaching the word because they are those who are called for the ministry of teaching and preaching. 
And that to me is, is also a sacred calling, but it's not a higher calling. All of us are called. All of us are part of God's kingdom and all of us are part of his agenda. So there's no higher calling, but there's individual calling. No higher or lower calling. In fact, today I, I like, I, I kind of, um, I'm very, very amused. When you go to a bank today and you want to see the bank manager, the most important person is not the bank manager, but the cleaner who cleans your hands and makes sure you're not, you're not, I don't have a temperature. Because they don't clean the bank and the, the place is, is, is declared a COVID area, the bank closes. So in a, in, a, in a dualistic mindset, we have a hierarchy. So and so is more important than, so and, uh, than, than the other. But in God's kingdom, we're a body. There's no hierarchy. The most important person may have the least, maybe the least person may have the most important role. So there's no higher role for priests and, 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 um, and, uh, and uh, Levites as it is for ordinary people. It's just a different role. Each of us plays a critical role. The frontline soldiers are always the people in the marketplace, especially when you look at Jesus' strategy. It does not discount those who have special roles. Okay, then somebody else asks here, are there businesses which you consider secular, like bars? Again, this is a very, very interesting question because the question itself betrays the mindset that a bar is secular and, and, uh, or some business is secular. Now, there may be businesses which are outrightly work against the fatherance of life. In Proverbs chapter eight, we're told that there are two ways of, of wisdom. The way, there are two ways, the way of wisdom that leads to life and the way of foolishness that leads to death. Now, I have a friend of mine who actually has a church in a bar and he used to make, uh, work with the East African breweries and he discovered that many poor people, just like Arthur Guinness, were drinking very, very illicit alcohol. He then got together Senator Keg, a very affordable beer. He now has a church where he is able to help people turn away from alcoholism and actually become ex-alcoholics and begin ministering to other alcoholics. So the context of the ministry is how do you redeem that context? Of course, the extremes. I would find it very difficult if somebody told me this Christian prostitution because you cannot violate the laws of God to advance the kingdom of God. But some cultural things, like whether or not we should wear kofias or grow beards, things like that, are things that can be redeemed and used for God's kingdom. But anything that leads to death, any business that leads to death, and let me put it this way, what are borders? What are borders are businesses that there's so much death in our, in our, in our, in our roads. In fact, the other day, just here in Nairobi, I was stuck for almost half an hour because some border border guy was killed in the road. I've just buried a border border fellow two weeks ago. So should we ban border borders and say border borders are evil? No, we need to have ways in which you can teach border border people to drive properly and, 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 and get disciplined because they play a critical service. But because people with an, an unregenerate heart whose minds are, are still very, very secular and who are greedy for money and who do not see themselves as redeeming that industry, run that industry. What would happen if Christians began to organize border border people and say, we're going to train them, we're going to give them proper licenses, and we're going to give them badges, and only those with badges are the ones who will be able to transport people and they can charge a higher premium. So we can all be redemptive agents, not allow death to thrive, but allow life to be promoted. Um, the next question is, um, in respect to church and politics, how engaged should the church be involved in politics? Given the connotation that politics is dirty. Now, let me also tell you, the church is dirty. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a church minister. There's so many churches where there's so much political strife amongst church leaders, it is sickening. The problem is not the institution, it's the heart of men, whether they're in politics or in the church. So I'll begin by saying, let's not think that the church is, is less, is cleaner, less dirty than the, the political world. I've seen corruption in the church. I've seen stealing in the church. I've actually been called to a church place where people are stealing the offering and I was asked to come in and intervene. So what is critical is the heart of man and where God has placed you. God can place you in politics. What for me I would, I would go against is trying to think there's going to be a Christian political party. I see Christians in politics, not a Christian political party. 
because politics divide and they divide based upon uh, certain ideologies. And those ideologies are driven by uh, particular needs uh, in, the, in, the, in the grassroots. So I would like to see Christians in every political party going there with the mind of Christ, being bridge builders and not dividers. So we need Christians in every sphere as bridge builders, not those who divide. And I know very many uh, Christians in a, in a group I, I'm part of who are part of different political parties, but we come together and have one, one agenda. How do we bring about building a prosperous Kenya? And we do it from different political uh, contexts because there's no political ideology which is Christian. All political ideologies have a contribution to make, but it's the people, not the ideologies that destroy the, uh, the nations. You see, what does it mean to de define success uh, not as a destination, but as a journey? I think most of us view success in business as whether we're going to make money or not, or even whether our business is growing or not. If we view it as a journey, then every day we wake up and I have learned and continued to recognize, like all of us are, that you can only live one day at a time. You cannot live 20 years at a time or one week at a time. And if each day you're committed to advancing God's kingdom and walking with him in fellowship with him, then you see it as a journey. You're not worried about what's going to happen next week or next month, but what is God asking you to do today in advancing his kingdom? So we don't live in the past, we don't live in the future, we live in the present. And in the present, we seek to walk with God and listen to him, helping us walk this journey with him. Now for some businesses, they will thrive. Some businesses will not thrive. But whether your business is thriving or not, whether your industry is going up or down, is how do you reflect shalom or God's peace in your heart. COVID has taught us so many things. Some people's industries have been destroyed. Other people's industries are thriving. Whether you're thriving or, 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 or being, um, um, or, 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 or your industry has been destroyed, is not the issue. Do you, have you learned to trust God and see God in that context? Are you still anxious about everything? Or are you learning to trust God in everything and seeing him lead you day by day? Then the next question is, um, come follow me and I'll send you out for fish for people. Is it that Jesus redirected his disciples from the marketplace, the so-called full-time ministry here? Okay, again, I like this question because Jesus was only involved in a three-year ministry here on earth. If you and I were going to design an agenda for the Son of God, you probably have given him 50 years to work here in this world and not three years. So when Jesus asked his disciples to come and follow him, there was an intense period of training and, and mentorship. Now, these were also people who are going to play a very special role in his, in his uh, um, agenda. But also realize this, that almost all of them, except John, were killed for following Jesus. So, I would say that Jesus, Jesus was not redirecting them from the marketplace to join his ministry. He was equipping them so they can be more effective in the marketplace. He was not putting them away from the marketplace, but equipping them. Because again, the whole concept of marketplace and what I call pulpit is a secular Western dualistic divide of the world. And even the way we define pulpit, that came about in the Reformation period about 200 years ago when Oxford professors began to speak from pulpits rather than go on like Jesus did and talk to people in the, in the crowd and talk to people in small groups. So how we deliver the ministry is not the same as the content of a ministry. The message is always the kingdom, whether we deliver it from the pulpit or deliver it in the marketplace. So let's not confuse the message with the methodology. The methodology will change over time. I mean, you guys are now doing this conference over Zoom. Has that changed the message? People like us are now have been banned from going to church because we're too old. Does that mean I can't go to church? So we're always going to change the methodology, but the message always remains the same. We proclaim the kingdom, whether it's over Zoom, 
or it's in, a, in the pulpit, and every one of us is a kingdom minister. But Jesus asking the disciples to, to fish for men was to change their focus not on the short-term gain, but the long-term impact of impacting people's lives, a focus on people's, the value of people, wherever God has placed you. How are you engaging with people? Because the reason why God has placed you there is because people, you're going to reach people who will never be reached by anybody else except those whom God brings into a sphere of influence. If you're a doctor or a teacher or a shopkeeper, the people who come into a sphere of influence who will never darken the doors of a church building, but they've come into a sphere of influence. How are you going to proclaim the kingdom among them? Now, early missionaries who carried the Bible, built schools, hospitals, where did the modern missionary lose it? Um, let me give you kind of a broad answer to that question. What happened is um, the liberal, the liber, uh, um, what's called, um, liberal theology began to impact the church about 150 years ago where liberal theology began to, to especially driven by, by the, by the what, what so-called Western Enlightenment movement, where people began to question whether the Bible was the word of God. And people began to look at reason as being superior to the word of God. So we had within the church, the liberal wing of the church and the orthodox wing of the church. The orthodox wing of the church was always focused on the uh, preserving the orthodoxy of the faith, but also the orthopraxy. Orthodoxy and orthopraxy was always at the center. Orthopraxy was love your neighbor as yourself. Orthodoxy was the doctrines that were the foundation of the church. So when modern missionaries came, because many of them particularly who were exposed to the navigators came from America, America had already gone beyond the, uh, had already gone to us, into, it was what's called a modernism, where the whole idea of uh, questioning truth and the dualistic view of, of the world had come into place. Now, because there was pressure from the, from, the, from the world, most evangelical people ran away from the world to protect themselves from those influences. And therefore, we gave up or did not see some of those needs which were provided for by the economies. Those missionaries who came from the West had social security, they had retirement benefits, they had uh, hospitals. So when, when they came to Africa, they, they saw those things not, not present. The original desire was to see the church as expressing the full ministry of Jesus, of, of not just proclaiming the, the kingdom, but of teaching the mind and also healing the body. So hospitals and schools were part of that. But then in a country like Kenya, at independence, some churches like the Anglican church gave those back to the government. The Catholics did not. The Catholics maintained those. And today, if you look at the Catholic church, it is the fastest growing church on the continent and in Kenya. And they, they have their most resources in terms of buildings, schools, hospitals. But the evangelicals and others who gave up those things are actually trying to catch up now. But it's going to take a long time to be relevant again. Even our, our theological and our, our, our development of theology was very much rooted in a Western worldview. So you find somebody like Tokumbo Adeyemo, who formed Negest, wanted to make sure that we have theology that is grown from the African soil. And he formed the theological colleges here, both in Nairobi and in Bangui, because secular, Western secular universities, no, West, Western theological universities have been very secularized and very Westernized. And the way they view theology is not necessarily always biblical. And we needed to have an African biblical perspective for responding to our needs. And theology is not a set of rules. Theology is answering from the Bible the questions people are asking in their context. Let me just repeat that again, okay? just in case you... <laughs> theology is not a set of rules. It's not a doctrine. When people have questions about life, it is finding biblical answers to those questions. The problem is that in Africa, we're asking different questions from those being asked by brothers in the West. So when you go to Western colleges, 
were answering questions nobody in Africa is asking. So we needed to have Africans who are responding from scripture because God's word is the authority, but responding to biblical uh, 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 African problems with biblical authority. You see, kindly uh, comment on how to respond to ties that come from funding in the development world, e.g. for abortion elements. Okay, let me uh, first of all talk about the issue of um, dependency. The world system, the cosmos of the world, is ruled by the God, small g, of this world, who is Satan. And his primary strategy is lies. Lies about who you are, what mankind is, why we're here, and where history, history is going. Discipleship is restoring God's mind for who you are, what God says you are made in his image, what our purpose here is on earth to restore the fallen creation, where we are, we are building for the kingdom and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. So many African countries, organizations, have embraced the agenda of the West without, because the, the primary focus is on getting the money from the West. And so one danger I have for us, or the one, one um, is it proposition I have for us is when are we going to develop and utilize our own resources and collaboratively work together so that we do not need to be dependent on the West. Now, if you say this is impossible, it is possible because you look at a, a nation like China, in one generation, they moved 400 million people from poverty to material wealth. But then I say material wealth is not necessarily wealth because spiritually the Chinese still need God and they're very, very empty inside. But here in Africa, we have been divided a continent of 1 billion people into 54 nations. And until we come together and see ourselves as one people, one, or have one, or, or having one, dest one destiny, it'd be very difficult for us to have one common voice and throw off the yoke of colonialism or dependence on the West. Now, part of this challenge has been the lack of infrastructure to connect us. And it's interesting that God is using a pagan nation like China to build the infrastructure here in Africa, to allow us to see ourselves not as divided countries, but as countries with a common destiny. We're always going to be diverse, diverse languages, diverse uh, ethnic groups, diverse political parties, but our destiny needs to be seen as a common destiny. And unfortunately, even in the smaller groups like the East African community, we still see ourselves as, as um, divided. Now, it's important for us that we begin to see ourselves not as dependent on the West and Western ideology, but as setting the pace and agenda for the rest of the world to follow. And I believe even something like COVID-19, despite its crisis for the world, may end up lifting Africa to a place where we begin to chart our own path, devoid of the shackles of the other countries. But at the, at the center of it all, to me, is what role are Christians, you and I, are going to be? We need to become what I call thought leaders, questioning the ideologies of our own people. Now, from where I sit, some of you may not realize how we have actually been able to go through this COVID period with, with, with these challenges by some amazing, um, uh, what do you call it, principles led by a president. I'm not here promoting a political party or an ideology, but the way we have dealt with contextually with the crisis of COVID here has actually helped us bridge the challenge because COVID was not just a health crisis. It was a socioeconomic crisis. People were losing their jobs. People were losing their livelihoods. But today the economy has somehow been managed, not by imitating the West, but coming up with solutions that are more African. In the West, they can give out money to everybody, but here we give out work so people could work with dignity during this COVID period and not be socioeconomically challenged. So when it comes to things like abortion and things like that, oftentimes we are stuck to taking up 
funds for people whose values are not biblical because we want their money. But I think we need to have the courage and say, we'll not take their money. Let me give you maybe another example uh, before I go to the other questions. One of the biggest turnarounds for this economy was when President Kibaki refused to follow the advice of the IMF. The IMF wanted him to have what they called poverty reduction programs. And they gave them money for poverty reduction programs. And he and the government around that time, Raila and Anyang Nyong and others, refused that terminology. They said, we want to have a creation, wealth creation budget, not a poverty reduction budget. Just by changing the wording, you change the perspective and you change the paradigm. So Christians change the language from lies to truth, from destruction to development. Okay, this says, are there theological perspectives that we need to be, be on the lookout for that may work against rise, uh, raising marketplace gospel careers? Okay, I'm going to answer that question from um, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Jesus, uh, sorry, Paul mentions three ways in which we relate to money. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. In the marketplace, we should not work for money. We should be servants of meeting people's needs and money should be the reward. If you do not have contentment, whether you're in the marketplace or whichever industry you are in, you'll be caught up in the greed and destruction of the world. So the first thing we need to recognize is do I have godliness with contentment? And godliness is not just spirituality, it's righteousness, right relationships. Then the second thing Paul warns people in 1 Timothy chapter 6 is those who desire to be rich will fall into a trap. They'll fall into very many hurtful and painful desires. So if your goal in the marketplace is to become rich, you'll be trapped by every scheme and scam that comes along. We must recognize that our goal in the marketplace is not to become rich. Our goal in the marketplace is to serve and to be validated by the payment that we get. If you're a businessman, profit is important, but it's not the goal. If you're in, in, in employment, you earn a salary, uh, but you do not set aside your values in order to get more money without values. The other day I was going through my, my devotional time and I read about Judas. How Judas, when he received the 30 pieces of silver, he went and bought a field and then went and committed suicide later on after Jesus had died. And I wondered, why did, how did Judas buy a field? Did the field cost 30, 30 uh, uh, silver, pieces of silver? Maybe the price of a slave? But it's very likely that, that as the Bible tells us, Judas was stealing from the, from the coffers of Jesus, pole pole, and maybe he had really bought the plot of land. And he needed just one more installment to finish paying for that land. So when he was told to betray Jesus, he saw the chance. So be very careful about your goals and objectives. Don't get into commitments that put you into debt. And therefore you become obligated to become corrupt because you've made commitments that stretch beyond your capacity. And the third type of person Paul talks about there in 1 first, first Timothy chapter 6 is command those who are rich to be generous, to be rich in good deeds. So if God does bless you and God will bless all of us and most of us will have more surplus money than we should, what is God asking you to do with that money? How is he asking you to use it to do good and to help others do good with it? So I think if you have those three perspectives in the marketplace, then you'll see yourself as serving the kingdom, whether you have no money, whether you have lots of money. Because what is the focus is the kingdom of God and not money. Money becomes a means and not the end. Are there marketplace enterprises strategically placed today for advance of the gospel in Africa? Okay, this question is a very dualistic question. There are there marketplace strategies for the advance of the gospel in Africa? You see, most people who view business, particularly you know, from a Western dualistic worldview, view business as an access vehicle 
that God has placed me in this business so that I can preach, so that I can disciple people. Now, that is only part of the story. God has you placed you in that business because you has the business itself to be a redeeming agent. So Noah's Ark was not just a chance to preach the gospel. Noah's Ark actually saved eight lives and many animals. So to me, rather than ask which industry, is you ask yourself, how in my industry can I become a redemptive agent? Where are the effects of the fall <clears throat> that have destroyed my industry that I can begin to address so that we begin to see God's righteousness and justice proclaimed? Let me give you, I'll give you two examples. About 10 years ago, the PCA church bought a hotel in Mombasa. Now, to the church going into business. But in the hotel industry in Mombasa, there's a very, very uh, satanic act of where people go to hotels with underage childs to molest them, to have sex with them. Now, the practice in hotels around the coast there is if you go into a hotel with a woman, they don't ask for the woman's ID. They only ask for the man's ID. So people are tempted to go and cheat. You go with a person who's not your wife, nobody's going to care because nobody has asked for ID. So what does the Christian hotel do? Do you stop having a business there? No, you, you say, how can we become a redeeming agent? So they talked to all the hotels around the coast there and said, all hotels today, can we covenant not to allow underage children to come into our premises with unknown men? And we as a hotel, when you come in, we want the idea of both the man and the woman to know who you are. Now that way you become salt and light. You don't stop running hotel business, but you stop the rot and the satanic, the satanic destruction in that specific industry. In every sphere, Satan is at work stealing, killing, destroying. And in every sphere, God has placed his people there as agents of salt and righteousness. So the question is, how is Satan destroying your sector? Is it the health sector? Is it the education sector? And how are you as a child of God being a redemptive agent there? And how can you rally others to bring about transformation and transition? And it's that process of redemption that points you out as a child of God and people ask you, why are you doing this? And the only answer is because of Jesus. Because Jesus is king here and Jesus is Lord here and Jesus' will is not being done in this situation as it is in heaven. Therefore, I I'm engaged in seeing about change. There's going to be danger. It's going to take time. But as a child of God, you're going to be fulfilled, not just about making money, but about seeing his kingdom come, his will being done. Righteousness and justice being manifested in your context. Another question here um, is kindly comment on what perspective should full-time gospel worker? Now, all of us are called. And God is going to call all of us to different vocations. And you need to be careful that you're not fulfilling somebody else's calling. If God calls you into a full-time vocation, it is to set aside your time like the apostles did to focus more on an aspect of his kingdom that needs to be focused on. This could be the ministry of the word, it could be a ministry of prayer, it could be an administrative role within um, a church organization, it could be a music ministry, whatever it is God is calling you to, we need to recognize that it's him who has called us to, but normally his calling also is aligned with his gifting and the passion he has placed in our hearts. Now for me, I was called into full-time ministry when I left university, I was called what I call vocational ministry, but because I saw the poverty around me and others had not yet seen that, I realized I could not help but create employment for the poor. So when I was working in Eldred, I helped by accident to start a company that was building houses and also began working with a, with a, a lorry business. But I was employing the people I was discipling. They are, they're not being discipled in the Bible study. They're being discipled on the job. They're watching me. In fact, we, I remember we studied several books of the, of the Bible. And when I had to leave elder to come back to Nairobi after six years, I asked the team of 20, I asked them, what is it you learned from the Bible during all those Bible studies that we had? Now, they did not say nothing, but they said, we learned more from seeing your life than from what you taught us uh, from the Bible studies. 
We saw how you reacted when there was no cement, when you were broke. We saw how you reacted when there were deadlines and we observed your life and we knew what it was to follow Jesus in the marketplace. So the marketplace is a good place and the place the impact is not going to be your teaching, which is important, is how you respond, how you live out the message. Jesus did not write any books, but the books are written about Jesus. If someone is write a book about you today, what book would they write? What are some Afri uh, African questions, ideologies that need biblical authority? Okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you just one or two. Africans are very, uh, the predominant worldview of Africans is animistic. An animistic worldview is one where we see the world as animated by spirits. Most of our secular Western Bible studies very rarely mention the spiritual realm, yet it is biblical. We very ha rarely, rarely have a Bible study on casting out demons. I've never seen an advocate a Bible study on that. And when, when I was, when, when, before I left as country leader, we actually did have assurance of deliverance. I'm being talking about deliverance from the, from the evil one. But spiritual warfare is completely missed out in many Western theological colleges because we've reduced Jesus to our concept and reduced Satan to an idea. But for most Africans, we're daily struggling against witchcraft. We're daily struggling against ancestral curses. We're daily struggling against um, satanic activities Yet Jesus won the victory over that. And so our Bible studies don't answer that, but a biblically rooted study, their answers to the Bible on those questions, but they never are focused. So we, leave, we don't live in victory because we're answering questions others are asking. But if we talk about Christ's victory over Satan, Christ's lie, uh, Satan's lies that dominate our minds and how they impact our, our cultures, then we find ourselves beginning to respond to the issues that Africans are asking. So, and this has got to do with what I call a theological um, uh, praxis. So it's not coming with a set of rules, but coming with a set of questions. What does this mean? And then going back to the Bible and asking, what does the Bible say? So the one thing that's, that is the same between the West and Africa is we committed to the authority of scripture. And that's one thing I value about the navigators. The one common denominator we have is we committed to the authority of scripture. Where I found divergence is we're asking different questions. The questions they're asking in India and China and uh, South Africa and West Africa are not the same questions being asked in Kenya and Uganda. So we need to go back and say, what questions are we asking? And then how do we develop an understanding of the answers from scripture, which is hard work because the scripture has the answers. We will take this last question on uh, gospel Christian music. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so that we can go into the breakout rooms. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me let me just answer that question uh, about uh, uh, gospel Christian music. First of all, if anybody wants to quote scripture, I'd be very very happy. But it doesn't make them a Christian. But the scripture quoted can be used by God. When Paul in the book of Acts, there was a demon possessed girl. And she kept saying, this man is bringing the message of God for you. But it is, it is where it was distracting from people hearing the gospel that, Jesus, that Paul rebuked and cast out the demon. So for me, if somebody, if, if secular people are reading and singing Christian music, the question I'd ask, is their life also reflecting Christian values? Then they're being a distraction and they're actually pulling people away from Christ because they're singing one song but leaving out another value. So it's not so much who's singing what, because non-believers can quote scripture and God can use it, but is their life distracting from God's righteousness and justice, or is their life seeking to align with God's righteousness and justice? So thank you very much. And um, there's a question here. I don't know, I don't know if, I, if, I, if, I, if I may answer that question, maybe last. Uh, sorry, 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 um, uh, Jay, let me just ask that question. It says you did a PhD in theology. What questions were you seeking to answer and how has it impacted your current workplace ministry? That's a very good question. I was, I was dissatisfied with the questions people answered about business in Africa. 
And the main thing that I observed was for them, business was an access vehicle, a means of coming to do evangelism in Africa. But I discovered that business itself is a redemptive vehicle, a means of transforming people's lives through business. That's my short answer. Um, you don't go to business as a means to do evangelism. You do business because you want God to use you as a redemptive agent to transform people's lives. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I think this is a very interesting um, discussion. And I know there are very many people with a lot of questions. And especially because um, our normalcy, as in how we think about things, has been disturbed. Um, yeah, it's it's not it's not the usual reinforcement of uh, long-held beliefs. This is this is a new way, a new perspective of looking at things. Uh, but for now, I think uh, I'll I'll uh, give it to Victor so that he can project some questions that we are going to discuss in the breakout rooms. Thank you.